Sjorin Kierkegaard and uh, a presentation on his book, Fear and Trembling. First, uh, about Kierkegaard's name. Um, Kierkegaard uh, means churchyard, and his family was named that because a couple generations before Kierkegaard was born, Denmark, where he, was, uh, where he lived, uh, was so backward that they didn't even have surnames. People didn't even have last names. And they were just beginning to uh, develop them, and so Kierkegaard's family got named on the basis of where they lived in a house in the churchyard. Um, however, I think it's uh, totally appropriate that churchyards are also very often used for graveyards, and so we can perhaps even translate his name as graveyard. And that taken together with his first name, Surin, which means in Danish it means sober. Um, so he, his name really is something like the sober churchyard or the sober graveyard. Um, so, uh, and also in Danish, I understand that it's pronounced Kierkegaard, but I, for, uh, forever since I started reading Kierkegaard, I've always called him that, so, um, that's what I'll call him. And we're going to talk a little bit about his book, Fear and Trembling, uh, which is the required reading, uh, for the, uh, for the assignment on Kierkegaard. Um, in terms of the assigned reading, what you need to read for this is, uh, well, there will be a translator's or editor's introduction, which will give you historical background and biographical background, which will help. I'll give you some of that as well, but uh, that might have some information you need, but that's optional. Uh, there are about three uh, short introductory uh, things uh, that Kierkegaard has in here, a, a, a tribute or eulogy to Abraham, and uh, uh, they're, each of them are about three, four, or five pages long. Uh, you need to read those. And then the major part of the work is separated into three problems, and you're required to read the first two problems. Now what you're going to find in this book is um, Kierkegaard trying to make a point about what he calls a night of faith, K-N-I-G-H-T, night of faith. And his model for that is going to be Abraham. Um, and so all of this uh, text is based on this story of Abraham and Isaac, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But quickly, um, Abraham, the uh, patriarch of Israel, and also the patriarch, uh, really the founding father, if you will, of Christianity and Islam as well, uh, Kierkegaard is, is commanded by God to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac. And so that's what you see here happening in the image on this slide. Um, as I say, we'll get into that story in just a little bit, but first we need to lay out some of the basics of Kierkegaard's life and uh, his philosophy. Kierkegaard, uh, on the one hand, was born into the heyday of German Romanticism. Uh, he never studied with... Uh, Hegel, but he studied with students of Hegel's and with other uh, ma major philosophers of the time like uh, Schelling. Um, however, you know, he wasn't German, so he didn't come uh, uh, from, you know, Germany was sort of the center of uh, philosophy in this time period. Uh, he came from Denmark, which, as I just mentioned, was a very backward, uh, but a very rapidly modernizing uh, country. Uh, Copenhagen was a city, I would liken it to a, uh, maybe Chicago in about the same time period, maybe slightly later. That is, um, it was an up-and-coming city, it was very fat, quickly modernizing, and just like, you know, the people in Chicago might look to New York for culture or look to uh, uh, San Francisco or uh, other major cities for uh, culture and the arts and um, you know, even things like fashions and uh, newspapers and things like that. Uh, Denmark looked to Germany and France. And so the, uh, the growing middle class in Denmark uh, was very interested in being, you know, modern like uh, the Germans and the French. And um, along those lines, uh, this is really the first age of consumerism uh, and mass media. Now, um, the consumerism and, and, and mass media really included things like the novel. The novel, you know, fiction was a, uh, a new craze at this time. Uh, also, newspapers were um, really in their heyday at this time. 
uh, pamphleteering was very popular. It was a good way to get a message out to people, um, you know, especially if it was a revolutionary message or something like that. The French Revolution, in fact, which had happened about uh, a little less than 20 years prior to uh, Kierkegaard's birth, uh, had really been um, sort of advertised by pamphlet pamphleteering. So there were all these uh, new media, of course, the railroads were coming in, et cetera, et cetera, uh, new, new media and uh, new wealth. And um, th this is going to be the situation that Kierkegaard reacts against. Um, now, in order to understand Fear and Trembling and the rest of Kierkegaard's works, you have to understand first something about his writing techniques. Kierkegaard, uh, not, sometimes Kierkegaard would write uh, directly. In other words, he would, uh, he, for example, in his late book, uh, The Point of View for My Work as an Author, he just lays on the line what he was trying to do with his works. Uh, he's trying to speak directly. But very often he used indirect communication. And we've talked about indirect communication before in regard to Plato's dialogues. Dialogue and dialectic are indirect forms of communication. Uh, uh, poetry can be indirect. Um, uh, aphorisms are a form of indirect communication. Um, and Kierkegaard employs a variety of different methods of indirect communication. Uh, you'll probably remember that the purpose of indirect communication is not to impart information so much. In fact, in Kierkegaard's case, like Plato's case, he thought, or Socrates' case, he thought that the problem was that people have too much information and that they're, they're too um, sold on their own uh, quote-unquote knowledge um, and they need to be shown their ignorance in some way. By the way, Kierkegaard is one of the great Socrates freaks in the history of philosophy. And in fact, his uh, dissertation was called The Concept of Irony and really is about Socratic irony and interestingly is written ironically, which is um, tricky. In fact, uh, his professors didn't really get what he was uh, uh, doing, but they did pass him anyway. Um, one of the forms of indirect communication that Kierkegaard uses is pseudonymous authorship. Uh, this simply means that he uses fake names, which is what a pseudonym means. Um, and this is a tricky area because, you know, there are a variety of reasons for using pseudonyms. One reason might be that you're trying to hide from the censors. Uh, you know, you have something to say, maybe something revolutionary, um, and you don't want uh, the censors to know what you're doing. Well, you might put somebody else's name on it. Uh, you might be uh, using a pseudonym, for example, Georges Sand, the great French novelist in the 19th century. That was a pseudonym. Uh, Georges Sand was actually a woman, but she knew she couldn't get published uh, uh, being a woman in that day and age, and so she used a man's name. So there's a variety of reasons for using pseudonyms. Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard is kind of interesting and odd, as everything about Kierkegaard is sort of interesting and odd. Uh, first off, um, you, we have to remember, when you, when you look at your text, Fear and Trembling, you see Kierkegaard's name on the cover, but we have to remember that his contemporaries would not have seen his name on the cover of the book. How, they would have only seen the pseudonym. However, they would have known exactly who wrote this book. So that begs the question, why did Kierkegaard uh, use pseudonyms if people were going to know uh, who wrote it anyway. And in part, he was trying to deflect attention from himself. Uh, he was trying to prevent the reader from simply uh, assuming that what was being presented was his own ideas. Uh, he was also making, he was also forcing the reader to do a, a bit more interpretation than, than some people might want to. Again, this is the age of consumerism. This is the age of pre-digested um, pre information coming to people through the newspapers. People, uh, you know, uh, wanted to be hip and happening and read the latest novels and be aware of all the latest things, but they didn't really want to think. Um, just like back in Socrates, Athens, people uh, loved to talk, but they didn't like to think much. And so... One of the reasons he uh, used pseudonyms was just to trip people up a little bit and force them to reckon with the text and, and to work uh, 
the, they had to do the reader has to do some work to get the meaning out of the text so that's one and we'll see how some of these pseudonyms work here in just a few minutes um, indirect communication and pseudonymous authorship are part of an uh, a larger project I guess you could say uh, that is known as imaginative construction and uh, imaginative construction um, is a uh, a principle of authorship that Kierkegaard uses uh, just in amazing ways. But it essentially boils down to Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard generally speaking, does not write biography or autobiography. Um, however, in all of his writings, he's talking about himself. But the way he does that is not autobiography. What he does is he takes, um, he takes the, events, the events of his life, and he abstracts from those events the structure of those events, the sort of conceptual structure or meaning of those events. He then finds stories like the Abraham and Isaac story or Antigone, the great Greek drama or some other story. Um, could be Bible. It's very often Bible stories. Uh, but he'll find a story that has a, a similar or the same structure, the same conceptual structure, and then he will play around with that conceptual structure. And uh, in this way, he is able to work through his own, um, his own, the, the issues of his own life, as well as to universalize his personal issues. So given Kierkegaard's philosophy, he had to start with himself. He had to start with uh, what he would call subjectivity, or the individual. And now, however, in order to universalize that, to make it so that it would apply to other people other than just himself, he, he used these stories in, uh, in order to present the, uh, the, the conceptual structure of this experience, which he felt all people would uh, understand. And the main story uh, that frames many of his uh, works is the story of his engagement to Regina Olson, who's pictured here. Um, Kierkegaard was betrothed to Regina before she was of marrying age, and he goes off to school and waits for her to get old enough. When she gets old enough to get engaged, they get engaged. He goes back off to school, and he starts thinking. Uh, now, Kierkegaard had a very tough upbringing. His father uh, was uh, very somber, morose, melancholy. His father had been very poor growing up as a shepherd boy. He had been freezing and starving. And uh, at one point, Kierkegaard tells us in his diaries, uh, his father had, um, you know, he was out there in the cold and starving, and he cursed God. And uh, this was something that Kierkegaard's father could not forgive himself when he was 82 years old. And uh, as a result, Kierkegaard's uh, father's gloominess, melancholy, really affected the whole family. In addition, uh, Kierkegaard's mother and uh, five children uh, died. So all that was left was Kierkegaard's older brother, Peter, and, I'm sorry, Michael, and uh, Kierkegaard himself. And so you can imagine the household, you know, the, the, the melancholy father with the uh, two uh, sons um, and you know, he was very strict. The father was very strict with him. And Kierkegaard says that he spent, uh, he learned how basically to hide in ideas. And one of the results of this was he really didn't understand how humans operate or how reality operates. He created all of these meanings and then he tries to see reality in terms of these meanings. Uh, he doesn't go from experience uh, to concepts, he goes from concepts to experience. And this creates problems because he thinks, well, uh, he started to think that he didn't, uh, he, he didn't want to be responsible for imposing his own psychological and spiritual issues on uh, Regina. And so he decides he needs to break off the engagement with her. Now, this is Kierkegaard, so he does this in the weirdest possible way. He... Um, you know, he doesn't just go write her a letter or text her or, well, I guess he couldn't text her, but uh, he doesn't just tell her, you know, it's, it's me, not you, um, you know, something like that. 
Instead, he decides that in order to um, save, you know, uh, to avoid scandal that would um, that would uh, be bad for her reputation, he would break off the engagement by writing a series of pieces in which he painted himself as a Don Juan. Um, now, we're going to be talking more about this character of Don Juan, so a quick word about that. Don Juan is a famous mythical character. It's been presented in many different plays, even in a movie called Don Juan de Marco with uh, uh, Johnny Depp and um, the guy uh, Marlon Brando. Uh, pretty good movie. I'd recommend it. Don Juan de Marco. Anyway, um, uh, Kierkegaard paints himself as this uh, Don Juan character, which means a ladies' man, somebody who really, uh, actually more than that, is a seducer of young women. Now, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, because this is the basis of Mozart's opera, Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni is just the Italian for the Spanish Don Juan. Um, and uh, he, so Kierkegaard writes a series of articles in which he uh, presents himself as a Don Juan, and that makes it possible for Regina to break off the engagement and supposedly save scandal. So that's already weird. I mean, you know, obviously it didn't, it, it hurt a lot of people's feelings and, and really caused a lot of problems. But, um, but Kierkegaard had a, a bigger thought in mind. And as we'll see, this is where it gets really strange in regard to what Kierkegaard is trying to present. Because in his mind, uh, he was going to, uh, he, he had gotten engaged to Regina he had now given her up. He had sort of, uh, quote-unquote, sacrificed her. Now, according to his thought process, uh, he expected to sort of miraculously get her back in some way. And this idea that he would get her back, as absurd as it is, is based on two things. One is Hegelian dialectic. Uh, Kierkegaard, as I said, studied with students of, of Hegel's and was a, uh, a very very much a Hegelian, but very much a strange Hegelian, unlike any of the other followers of Hegel. So, you know, the, the Hegelian dialectic, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis dialectic, which, you know, the thesis was he got Regina, the antithesis was he, set, he gave her up, he sacrificed her, and then the synthesis was supposed to be that he miraculously got her back. Um, and this also dovetailed very nicely in Kierkegaard's head with, um, uh, a, you know, a pattern that we see very often in the Bible where God gives a blessing, God takes the blessing away, and then God restores the blessing, uh, you know, many times over. Um, and uh, we'll see how that plays into the story of Abraham and Isaac as well. The first translation of Kierkegaard's works into English were by Walter Lowry, and this is a quote from Lowry's biography of Kierkegaard, which is quite good. Um, and what it says is that what Kierkegaard do is, uh, would do is he would not just relate his life autobiographically, but he would keep that truth, that verity, as it says here, that truth for himself, and then refract it in various ways, through use, again, using various stories that have the same or a similar structure. And one of the things you'll notice, um, if you're familiar with any, uh, uh, you know, writings on, on scripture or theology or whatever, is that what Kierkegaard is doing here is not theology. Um, it's not also exactly philosophy in the uh, sort of normal sense, if there is one, uh, what it is is a very novelistic or poetic uh, form of philosophy, and where he takes these uh, stories that have a similar structure to what he has experienced, at least in his mind, in his concepts, and he uses those stories to work out uh, the meaning of these events. But it is true that the, the engagement and the breaking off of the engagement with Regina... Uh, oh, I didn't tell you the end of the story. <laughs> the the uh, upshot of this story was that he breaks off the engagement with Regina in this weird way. And then he, um, uh, then he goes back off to school in Berlin and um, 
Now he expects that he's, you know, again, according to the dialectic, according to this pa biblical pattern of, you know, giving a blessing, taking a blessing away and restoring it, Kierkegaard expects to get her back. But while he's in Berlin studying, he hears through the grapevine that uh, Regina has gotten engaged to somebody else. And he realized at that point that uh, ideas are not events, that, you know, he really realized the difference between what was going on in his mind uh, in terms of how he was putting these concepts together and the way reality works and the way that people work. And that, in fact, uh, ideas only have the reality of possibility um, and uh, that ideas don't change reality. And that is really going to be the key point of his departure or his, let's say, more like a conflict uh, with uh, Hegel's philosophy. He's going to realize that what Hegel is talking about, um, you know, the dialectic, works at the level of ideas, but doesn't do a thing for telling us about reality. So if you'll remember Hegel's uh, philosophy, it's the, or the, his epistemology that we did in form of a timeline, where history is the history of the development of human consciousness or the, of, of spirit from just spirit, just awareness, to full-on, uh, what uh, Hegel calls absolute spirit, full-on absolute consciousness, self-reflective consciousness. Um, now, we, I think I mentioned in that lecture, I hope I did, uh, that um, there are three elements to Hegel's uh, dialectical uh, understanding of history that uh, Kierkegaard uh, will, will challenge or change. Uh, one of those is that history is progressive. And now Kierkegaard is going to, does think there is going to be progress of spirit or progress of what he would call, uh, or Hegel would call, potentiation of spirit. In other words, uh, how spirit or consciousness becomes more and more powerful. Um, it knows more things, but it also becomes more self-reflective. Uh, and um, Kierkegaard is going to agree there is progress in consciousness, but it, um, then he's going to disagree about how that happens. The second element of Hegel's philosophy is that it is deterministic, which means the stages of history fall, follow one another in a given order. And you can't change that order, and you can't skip stages in history. Uh, Kierkegaard is going to say, no, the progress of consciousness is something that requires freedom. It has to be chosen. Uh, it can't just history can't do it for us, as it were. And the third element of Hegel's philosophy that Kierkegaard revises, let's say, is that history is objective, and that means that uh, the the events of history, the way the unfolding of history happens um, outside of us, uh, without our input really, and our personal subjective uh, pr spiritual progress doesn't matter to history. Um, and therefore, Hegel's philosophy, Kierkegaard thought, tended uh, to dovetail all too well with the uh, rise of consumerism and the rise of mass movements and the rise of democracy and all of these ways in which European society was tending more and more toward uh, aggregating in large groups rather than uh, emphasizing the individual at all. And Kierkegaard instead put the emphasis on subjectivity, the individual. That's where progress happens. That's where the struggle needs to happen, Kierkegaard thought. And so what we'll look at are the three stages of subject formation according to Kierkegaard. So these are the three stages of subject formation or the formation of the subject. The aesthetic, the ethical, and the spiritual. And what we'll do is we'll see that while Kierkegaard rejected elements of Hegel's philosophy, he did keep the dialectic but he made the dialectic not work at the level of history, which is something we can't change, but at the level of the individual self. So there is a dialectic in each, well, there is a dialectic at least in the first two stages, uh, the aesthetic and the ethical stage. As we'll see, the spiritual stage, um, well, that's a whole different matter. That's a, a very different uh, stage.
the aesthetic stage has to do with aesthesis, the senses. Uh, however, this is not just sheer hedonism as described by Kierkegaard. Uh, again, hedonism is just seeking pleasure. That's not what Kierkegaard is talking about. Kierkegaard is not talking about the um, the aesthetic experience of a uh, you know of a wine or a drunk, but rather the uh, aesthetic experience of a connoisseur of wine, for example, somebody who has developed their taste, who cultivates their taste, who uses their reason in the service of sensuality. And it should be pointed out that sensuality does not mean sexuality, although sexuality is of course part of sensuality. And um, uh, well, let me give you the example here, and then we'll turn to the thesis and antithesis. The example comes from a, a two-volume work that Kierkegaard wrote called Either Or. And the first volume of this work has to be one of the strangest setups of any of his books. Uh, so first off, remember that Kierkegaard's name would not appear on the book. So the name that appears on the book uh, is um, Hilarious Bogbinder, one of Kierkegaard's pseudonyms. Hilarious Bogbinder. Bogbinder means bookbinder, and so that's Kierkegaard's uh, name for the editor of this uh, volume one of Either Or. So Kierkegaard's not the author, nor is this editor. But the editor tells us in a preface that that uh, he had known a young man who was a poet, and uh, this young man would uh, send his poetry to uh, the publisher to get published, and. Um, he, the the publisher Bogbinder says that you know he knew that the young man was uh, you know really a kind of a Don Juan kind of a rake kind of a guy that's going out there and um, you know getting into all kinds of uh, as well if we politely can call it aesthetic experiences sensual experiences and and you know typical poet um, and uh, the editor says Bogbinder says. One day, the poem stopped coming, and he didn't hear it from the young man. And then he got worried about the young man, where, what had happened to him. So he went over to the young poet's uh, apartment, and sure enough, the door's ajar, and the place is trashed, and no sign of the young man. And so the editor says, you know, well, being, you know, I went in and looked around, and there were some unfinished writings on his desk, desk so I gathered those up, and I'm presenting them here. So the setup to this book is... Kierkegaard's not the author. Of course, we know he is, but according to what the book presents, Kierkegaard's not the author. Hilarious Bogbinder is the editor, not the author. The author is an anonymous, disappeared uh, young poet, a Don Juan type of character. Um, and this, I think, represents exactly what Kierkegaard is worried about in the case of the aesthetic stage, because now we can get to thesis and antithesis. Because on the one hand, uh, the thesis is that, a, that sensual experience, especially the cultivation of sensual experience, uh, is, you know, it's a real experience of reality. And even more than that, it's intensifiable. Uh, intensifiable means it can be made more, it can be made stronger, more intense by using your mind to, to develop it. Uh, you know, uh, somebody who, for example, like me, I can't, I really can't stand wine because I haven't developed the taste for it. But somebody who works at it and, you know, cultivates that taste using their reason to understand what all the different principles, uh, you know, in a good wine are, uh, can, you know, develop into a connoisseur of wine. Um, and the same thing is true of most sensual experiences is that they can be intensified by using our reason to, uh, to, to get better experiences, more intense experiences. Now, the antithesis is that in aesthetic uh, experience, there is no repetition. You can't have the same aesthetic experience twice. Now, Kierkegaard writes a book called Repetition, in which he describes uh, someone, himself probably, uh, trying to repeat an aesthetic experience. He goes to a performance of uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni, in Berlin and has, you know, a, a mind-blowing experience. So he decides when he's back in Berlin the next year, he'll try to have the same experience again. And he gets a ticket, he sits in the same seat, he gets it on the same week of the, uh, a day of the week. Um, you know, he tries to repeat every aspect of the experience. And of course, what happens is that he, it fails miserably because you can't have the same aesthetic experience twice.
And so if there's no repetition, that means that in order to get the same uh, intensity of experience, you've constantly got to get new experiences and more intense experiences. And the danger there is that you wind up sort of uh, chasing the dragon, right? You just wind up chasing experiences. Um, and even though they can be made more and more intense, of course, it also becomes more and more dangerous. Um, and the Romantics would have called this danger the danger of dissipation. Dissipation means to sort of waste or to spend yourself in experiences. And essentially that's what the, the, uh, the uh, strange setup to either or represents. Again, it's not Kierkegaard who wrote the book. It's not Hilarious Bogbinder who wrote the book. It's an anonymous disappeared artist. Uh, and that represents that this artist, through seeking sensual experiences, has dissipated himself. So that's the thesis and antithesis the synthesis of this stage, then, is the next stage, the ethical stage. The ethical stage is reason in the service of morality, and it's best represented by Volume 2 of Either Or. Volume 2 of Either Or is um, a series of letters written by Judge William, or Judge Wilhelm, depending on the translation, uh, to the young man in Volume 1. Now, Judge William is a judge. He's a representative of the ethical itself, of the law, of duty. And um, he's an older man. He's married. Uh, he's a pillar of society. Uh, he is the very model of, an, of the ethical stage. And, um, you know, you could kind of imagine that this would be a, a kind of, could, could be a really horrible uh, text to read, you know, you have an older guy giving a younger guy advice, you know, when I was your age, you know, um, you need to pull up your pants and comb your hair and go out and get a real job, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but Judge William, and th this is typical of Kierkegaard, Judge William is a beautiful character, and this is not at all a judgmental character, or a judgmental uh, text that we're reading, uh, but really, um, you know, the ju Judge William comes from a place of real love for this young man and wants to give him sound advice and really does identify with him. Um, and as I say, you know, one of the amazing things about Kierkegaard is um, that his characters are fully rounded characters. He sees every perspective. Kierkegaard was able to take every perspective on a, on a character and to get that into his text. Um, now, the ethical here, we're talking about law, duty, basically any set of principles that are universal, uh, not in the sense of universal the world over, but at least universal uh, uh, to the group of people who follow that law. So, for example, um, you know, Danish law would be universal for Danes, um, but it wouldn't be obviously universal for Frenchmen. French law would be. So in that sense, the ethical is the universal. It applies to everybody equally. Uh, and um, Kierkegaard, very much the uh, uh, Lutheran, all the, you know, uh, points out that in regard to the law, we're all in a position of sin and spiritual struggle because none of us uh, can fully fulfill the law. We'll come back to that point in a minute. Now, the thesis of this stage is that it's ultimately stable. I mean, when are you supposed to uh, fulfill the law or do your duty? You're supposed to do it every single time. When are you supposed to stop at a stop sign? When you feel like it, when you're not in a hurry, when uh, on alternate Tuesdays? No, you're supposed to stop at it every time. When are you supposed to feed your children? Every other day, every couple of days. Heck, they're not going to starve to death, right? No, you got to feed them every day. That is uh, a parent's duty. So the, the thesis here, unlike the aesthetic stage, the ethical stage is ultimately stable. Now the antithesis is, as we've just said, no one can fulfill all the law all the time. Um, as St. Paul says, we are all guilty under the law. And this leads to uh, the synthesis of this stage, which is what Kierkegaard calls the night of infinite resignation. The night of infinite resignation is a person who realizes the ethical is the highest meaning of existence. After all, it's, uh, God's law is part of the law, too. So this is the highest level of meaning of existence for the night of infinite resignation. 
But the Knight of Infinite Resignation knows that they can't fulfill all the law all the time, but resigns themselves resigns themselves to trying to do so anyway. So the the uh, Knight of Infinite Resignation is the best possible person uh, ethically that you can imagine. But it is a state of despair because they can't, it's the highest form of human good, but that's as far as they can go. The spiritual stage is really not a synthesis of the previous uh, uh, dialectic, the, the ethical stage, uh, because in the case of the aesthetic and the ethical stages, these are ways in which the human individual relates to reality, finds meaning in the relationship to reality. I should make a point here that when I say reality, I mean being or existence. And in the case of Kierkegaard, you can also say God. Uh, when Kier what I mean by that is when Kierkegaard says God, um, he really uh, is thinking existence, reality, being. And uh, now that doesn't work for everybody. And in fact, Heidegger specifically says, don't do that with my philosophy. Don't equate being and God. But for Kierkegaard, it works very well. And he is an existentialist. The highest principle is existence or God. In the spiritual stage, what's different about it is where the first two stages were a human being trying to get meaning uh, through the relationship with reality. The spiritual stage is one in which reality, existence being God, uh, comes to the individual. And this creates a situation, or can create a situation, it doesn't always, it can create a situation called the teleological suspension of the ethical, in which uh, the uh, reality calls a person to do something uh, beyond ethics, or as Nietzsche might say, beyond good and evil. Tele teleological here means there's a goal um, that, is, uh, that is higher than the ethical. In other words, there's a goal that may or may not be ethical. Uh, so, for example, in the case of the Abraham story, God, uh, reality being, calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That is not an ethical call, but therefore, because it's God talking, Abraham has to suspend the ethical for the sake of this higher good. And this higher good, there's nothing that can mediate it. It's just the individual and God being existence reality. Um, as it says here, the individual stands in an absolute relation to the absolute. Um, this requires on the part of the individual a leap of faith. But again, it's really not so much something that a person or an individual does uh, as something that happens to them. According to the dialectic, overall dialectic that uh, Kierkegaard is tracing here, the spiritual stage goes uh, beyond the first two stages uh, in a way that um, really goes beyond rationality itself. Um, and for that reason, this, the spiritual stage is also known as the impossible or the absurd. So this is kind of a strange thing. Essentially what Kierkegaard is saying is that God is absurd or impossible. And now by absurd here, he doesn't mean ridiculous. Absurd in philosophy means beyond meaning or without meaning. God, in other words, is so transcendent, so wholly other from human being that God doesn't have, uh, uh, God is beyond all human meanings. And in that sense is absurd. There is no way, Kierkegaard thinks, that we can bridge the gap between ourselves and reality unless God or reality bridges that gap for us. And so this is why Kierkegaard has this strange idea that the way that the dialectic works, the way that God works, is that God gives a blessing, God takes away the blessing, and then God restores the blessing. Now, at the ethical, at the ethical level, as the quote here says, at the ethical level, uh, Abraham, you know, taking his son to sacrifice him, is guilty at the very least of attempted murder and child abuse. As Kierkegaard says, uh, Abraham was a murderer every minute. Or, 
we stand before a paradox that is higher than all mediations. And that's what Kierkegaard thinks is actually happening. Kierkegaard says that when God orders Abraham to kill Isaac, and, Isaac, and Abraham agrees to, nevertheless, Abraham believed that after killing Isaac, God would restore Isaac to him. Now that's absurd. That is meaningless. That doesn't make any sense according to any normal human concepts. But again, when we're dealing with God or reality, human concepts don't, you know, don't go far enough uh, to explain what's going on. So this, you know, this is a movement of faith. And so Abraham, according to Kierkegaard, is a knight of faith because he believes in the absurd. I just want to mention the image here is by the great uh, Russian Jewish painter Mark Chagall, who's probably most famous for the uh, Fiddler on the Roof painting. Um, and uh, it's wonderful stuff. If you ever get to see some Chagall paintings, they're, they're just wonderful, magical type of painting. So the actual movement of faith is this double, double movement of the spirit, renouncing something and expecting to get it back. It's that uh, paradox. Um, and one of the things Kierkegaard does in order to distinguish the night of faith and the night of infinite resignation is he points out that you would never know a night of faith from outward appearances. Now, a night of infinite resignation you would know because they're such good people, they just, they just seem good, they just are good, they're, they're really reliable, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're just good people, and, and they carry that aura about them. Whereas on the other hand, the Knight of Faith might appear as a bourgeois philistine. This is a term that comes from the uh, German Romantics, and um, it, it basically means uh, it's a way of depicting especially the sort of nouveau riche, the up-and-coming up middle class, as, you know, they're wealthy, but they have really no class. They have no, uh, th they think of themselves as the, the center of civilization and, the, the, you know, the, the pinnacle of civilization, uh, but in fact, they are crass. Well, I mean, you can think of basically any of, uh, Dickens' antagonists, for the most part. Those would be bourgeois Philistines. Um, and he has a wonderful depiction of the Knight of Faith. He says, you know, you can't, you wouldn't never know the Knight of Faith from outward appearances. Could just be a guy who gets up in the morning and, you know, kisses his wife and goes down to the bakery and gets a, you know, a baguette and a cup of coffee and comes back and sits on the veranda and watches the children playing in the street and goes to work and comes home and that's all he does. I mean, he just He's, he's a schlub. He's not anybody special. The difference between an, a normal person and the night of faith, though, is the night of faith, when God, reality, being, existence calls, the night of faith immediately responds and, of course, expects not only to have to give up something, but to get it back, to be blessed with it again. So that, that uh, holding on to that absurdity is really the key for Kierkegaard uh, to the night of faith. And so Abraham resigned everything uh, infinitely and grasped everything again by virtue of the absurd. So impossibility is this movement of faith. Um, and again, absurd and impossible refer to the idea that God, reality, being, existence is beyond any meanings that human beings can put on it. And so to look at or experience reality directly without any meanings, without any preconceptions at all, well, that might be pretty scary. And in fact, that's exactly what Kierkegaard calls anxiety in his book, The Concept of Anxiety. Um, it is a fear response in the absence of a, uh, a, an object of fear. So one has the response one would have if one were to be attacked by a lion, but there is no lion. In this case, there is reality itself. Um, an example, I mentioned it in a previous presentation, but I'll mention it again. This is Kierkegaard's example in the concept of anxiety. His example is Adam and Eve, where God tells them that if they eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, on that day they'll die. And Kierkegaard points out that they couldn't possibly know what God means. Now, they knew it was scary, but they couldn't possibly know what death is because nobody died yet. Well, in fact, 
we're in the same position. We haven't died yet, so we can't know what death is either. And so therefore, we, as much as Adam and Eve had that anxiety, we do too. Death isn't an object. It is, you know, it, it's not something that you can uh, grasp as an object of fear. And um, therefore, we're confronted with a, uh, a threat that is nameless. And I think that well describes what Kierkegaard's getting at here in terms of absurdity and impossibility. Here's Kierkegaard's gravestone and his epitaph, I had perished had I not perished. Very typically paradoxical to the end uh, was Kierkegaard. Um, if you're... Uh, if you have time, you should also try to view on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, if you dial up um, Kierkegaard documentary, uh, there's a documentary on Kierkegaard from the BBC called, and it's part of a series of, uh, of documentaries uh, called The Sea of Faith, and it is narrated by Don Cupitt, C-U-P-I-T-T. -T. Um, and it's a very, very good presentation of Kierkegaard and his life, uh, and will give you some other insight. Now, if you watch that film, it will open up with some images of the Russian Revolution and some talk about Marx. And the connection there is that Marx was also a student of Hegel's. Marx, in his own way, took on Hege Hegelian dialectic, but Marx said that the dialectic isn't, uh, the, the, the dialectic that makes history progress and makes human consciousness progress is not a dialectic or a conflict between ideas. It's a conflict between the owners of the means of production and the workers. In other words, the haves and the have-nots, the wealthy and the poor. That's the conflict that really drives history forward for Marx. And Marx thinks that, uh, like Hegel thought, that history has certain um, stages. One stage, for example, would be the feudal period, the feudal economy in which you had lords and peasants. And that conflict led to the rise of capitalism, in which we have the owners, the capitalist owners, and the workers. And the conflicts in capitalism, Marx thought, would ultimately lead to resolution in communism. Um, and for Marx, these stages are fixed, which is why when Marx was asked where the communist revolution should be expected to happen first, he said England, because England had the most develop developed capitalist economy, and therefore the next stage would be communism, according to Marx's historical uh, interpretation. That someone asked him, well, what about Russia? Why couldn't, you know, they're, they're having some stirrings of revolution in the mid-1800s. Why couldn't Russia uh, have a communist revolution? And Marx said simply, well, there's, their economy is still a feudal economy. It's not even a modern capitalist economy. They don't even have any industry to speak of. So how are they going to, you know, again, for Marx, you have to go from feudalism to capitalism to communism. You can't skip capitalism. So that's the kind of determinism that Kierkegaard rejected in Hegel's philosophy. Uh, Kierkegaard uh, probably did not know Marx's writings, but he would have uh, disliked them as well. So it's a good comparison that you'll see at the beginning of that film where they're comparing Kierkegaard on, and Marx uh, as to, you know, um, this, the development of, of the spirit, as it were. That's the real key theme that they both share. But they, uh, Marx views that as an objective process that takes place in uh, social conflicts, whereas Kierkegaard uh, says that it takes place at the level of subjectivity of the individual. The individual is supreme for Kierkegaard.